and welcome back to the Learn to Code podcast. Today's episode is about how learning to code and actually code are two different things. First, I just got back from my new job and I'm returning at 6 p.m. So I figured that maybe I do have some time to try out the new things that I just learned um, on YouTube this weekend and at Udemy especially for video editing. So this episode of the podcast is going to be uh, published at YouTube later on today, I guess. So uh, what is learn to code? And a lot of people believe that learning to code is basically just um, gather whatever sources you come around on the internet or maybe a book, and follow along your chosen programming language, and do some exercises and uh, with with very little deep knowledge of the programming language or even the platform that you are developing for, you just step into creating a product and you figure out that, well, maybe uh, a big part of learning to code is to actually step in into a job and learning uh, as you go along on that job. And while this approach is um, uh, not entirely true, maybe it does apply a lot. And a lot of people, especially professional developers, uh, they find themselves learning a lot of things on the job. Uh, However, the things that they learn are not the basic ones. Uh, The thing that, that you are going to be learning on the job is not going to be how to create a for loop is not going to be how to create a class or implement uh, methods on that class or even inheritance. Um, um, Those things are considered basic stuff in the eyes of a contractor, in the eyes of uh, a software developer professional. Um, What I mean by learn to code is to, uh, first off, um, first you need to choose whatever programming language you are going to be uh, learning on based on whatever you want to actually build. So if you want to build um, a mobile application for Apple, uh, you are going to be learning Swift programming language. If you want to develop for the Android platform on the mobile space, you are going to be learning Android. Um, uh, And I mean um, Kotlin, right now is the, is the main one and second is Java right now and if you want to develop websites uh, you need a very good uh, understanding of HTML, CSS and JavaScript and that's just to really begin developing websites so there is a lot of things to learn and most of the time just seeing the amount of knowledge Uh, and skills that you need to actually learn to build something useful, it's going to be very tempting to think that you can actually um, learn to code code while you are developing a project that you want to develop, or even that you are going to learn to code while working for somebody else. And learning to code is not like that at all, actually. Uh, because although the simple things you can manage to understand, and these simple things are basically variables, loops, maybe even uh, class implementation and creation, and maybe some things that you may believe that those are the advanced stuff, maybe. Uh, one time I find out that um, a guy that was working as a database administrator, uh, he never used relationships between tables uh, because he believed that relationship between database tables are way too advanced and the project doesn't really require that level of uh, understanding about databases. He was really wrong on that one. Uh But the thing is that uh, learning to code, it doesn't have to be while you are already on the job. It is assumed 
that if you are learning to code, you are learning to code. You are not producing something really useful. Um, maybe if you can compare it to learning to play an instrument, a musical instrument, I don't think that a piece created for music students that wish to learn how to play a violin, for example. I don't know anything really about music or how to learn music, but I but I really think that if you actually want to learn to play an instrument properly, you are not going to be focusing on a piece that is actually a finished a finished song, a finished product. You're going to be giving to your students something that is designed from the ground up for the sole purpose of practicing the essential. So uh, I guess that something similar to that on the software development world would be exercises, maybe algorithmic problems, you know, the kind of... Uh, exercises and programs that you are being asked to to program that doesn't really solve a, a, a really practical problem out there. They just exist for the sole purpose of exercising your brain into solving real problems and more sophisticated problems in the future. So learning to code must be treated as such as you are learning. You are not building something. And this comes apparent as soon as you try to actually build something else. Uh, most of the time when I come out of a boot camp or when I finish a video course on, on the internet, especially on Udemy and, and Code Academy, um, how is the la uh, and Plura site? So those websites create their content based on the purpose of just learning how to build something. Although the courses that include complete projects that you can actually take into the workforce, well, those are really useful too. But the truth is that individual videos or individual topics um, are being created these kind of exercises that just, um, that they don't really uh, nobody's going to pay you for doing them in the end, uh, but they are really useful for exercising the basic stuff. For example, uh, creating a personal website using HTML alone and then improving that website with CSS and then maybe improving that website, in, uh, applying animations and some other techniques using JavaScript. Uh, it's, be, it's going to be very rare that you are going to get paid just to do th that same thing on a real job uh, because the technologies used, although seem to be way too much when you are starting, uh, the truth is that HTML, CSS, and client-side JavaScript are a very little piece of all the machinery required to actually create a website. So... However, uh, they are very valuable, although they are not really implemented as such uh, on, on a real project, so to speak. Uh, those exercises are really valuable because your brain is actually learning and is actually activating and focusing on the way that the things need to be done. So nobody is going to be paying you the big bucks for building a personal website with HTML and CSS. Uh, the first thing that you are going to be hearing is that uh, nobody is going to pay you that because WordPress already exists, because a Squarespace already exists. And although to achieve that level of results, you can achieve them using those tools and there are even more tools in development right now. The truth is that uh, those tools, although they are really useful, they are very empowering and limiting at the same time. And why is that? 
because the second that you want to do something specific that nobody else seems to be developing at the moment, uh, the second that you uh, leave the pre-established road to success in their eyes, um, or you just want to create your own product and make it your own, then it comes. Uh, it becomes very uh, apparent that these uh, initially very powerful and empowering tools, they are really limiting. Because if you get out of the realm that these tools specialize, for example, uh, you try to create uh, a, dis a, visual, a graphic design for your website and implement it on WordPress, uh, you are going to find yourself that even if you really like a team for WordPress website, um, once you choose that team and you want to, you know what? I just want to change this little thing and maybe I can remove it. Maybe I can add something else, but it's going to be very rare that you can actually change the shape or the color of a menu or a button around um, unless the team maker actually allows you to to do the change via a menu or something like that. If you really want to have access to the team and customize it to your liking, uh, inevitably you are leaving the realm of click and drag and you are entering the realm of uh, stack overflow searching and coding. So... And if you are working with WordPress, coding is the last thing you want to do right there. So getting back to the to the topic of academic exercises, uh, learning to code is filled with this because although individually they don't really enable you to just work doing those, th those kind of things, uh, the truth is that the skills that you are developing are required to actually do the job. And learn to code becomes this paradoxical idea of, uh, well, if I want to do the coding, the actual coding, uh, I'm not learning how to do the coding while coding. Um, if I explain myself better, Learning to code and actually code are two different things. So on one side, we do have learn to code, which is basically this structured, this uh, algorithmic focus activity and learning activity, really, with very um, specific practical uses. And then we have the actual coding. So, uh, to actually code means, for me at least, that you are actually creating something, that you are creating a product. And this product is going to be, uh, well, actual software. And no matter what, the first thing that I notice with people trying to learn to code while developing a project is that mo uh, most of the time these projects are left alone and abandoned midway or even before that and why does this happen because these people wants to answer a really complex question in a very simple manner for example how do i create a facebook page uh, or a facebook website how do i create a social media page how do i create my own instagram clone my facebook clone my youtube clone whatever it is and sadly for them, they quickly realize that there is not a simple answer for them. You cannot just download uh, a program, pay a rent for that program, and or, or, or download an app and just create your website there. There is no such thing. Uh, especially on web development, since we are working with technologies that were designed with um, requirements from 40 years ago. So it's really hard to 
use those technologies in innovate in innovative ways today without making some compromises. So actually code becomes this activity of solving real problems and solving problems for, for everybody else. And what I mean by this is that some sometimes you, for example, if you are developing a, a blog website, one of the main features of a blog website is to be able to to write down articles or blog posts into your website, obviously. And some people actually think that they, well, they actually expect because they had seen it on other blog websites that you write down uh, in a Word-like, in a Microsoft Word-like interface and, and they expect you to just allow them to write down a document like if it were um, a Word document. And services like Google Docs um, had opened the gates for people thinking that, well, if I can do this on Google Docs. I don't know why I cannot use this to write my articles on such and such website. Or if you are paying to to bring to the to the internet your own company website uh, and you are expecting you know I, I am expecting to be able to choose the font size and and whatever font I want on my website so if I am writing an article maybe I want to use uh, some really cute font that I found um, somewhere around instead of using the webmaster selected font for the website and obviously the webmaster is going to say you know what uh, i did choose the font to be co uh, to have some sense of of sameness of coherency between all the web pages on the website uh, but the guy that is actually writing the article he may like to have a more more customized way or more customized text on his articles or her articles. So it becomes this battle of creating features that help the end user achieve success and at the same time uh, take care of the user and avoid him or her making mistakes that cause the website some viewers or some users. So actually code is not just sitting down in front of the computer and writing uh, pre-established algorithms on a programming language and call it a day. Um, more likely than not, is experimenting, is creating features and putting those features into, into the hands of the end user. And most of the time, whatever thing you think is uh, really easily and intuitive to understand, most of the time, the end user is going to find out ways to just break it or just uh, misuse it. We, we see this happening over and over because the guy that is actually building the thing doesn't understand the thing because he's not the pilot. Um, it's, the same, it's, it's, it's a similar relationship that uh, Formula One pilots had with their uh, mechanical engineers. So we we can say that both roles have a deep understanding of the car, yet they ex they, um, they get to experiment and they get to experience the car in two different ways, very different ways. So uh, the mechanic is going to know how the machine works and what it is required to bro to 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 work in high performance situations and he's going to see what the machine is doing from the inside while the pilot is not just um is 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 putting all his attention on how to drive the thing how to drive the car and he's expecting that the car just perf uh, performs as expected 
he's not thinking about, you know what, maybe the fuel that we're using is not good enough. Maybe the, these new tires, uh, they are, they are too new for the car. Maybe they need to, um, they need to get used a little bit before the race. Who knows? I don't really know anything about racing. So <laughs> take it with a bit of salt. But what I'm trying to say is that actually sit down and go something for real people. Uh, requires you to learn something besides the actual coding itself. Um, and here is where the realm of user experience and user interface engineers comes by. So it's not the same to know how to do a web page as to, to know what to build for that web page. So it's not the same to know how to build things and another another different thing is to know what to build and how and how it should be presented so just because you can work with your hands doesn't mean that you have to do it that way so actually code is going to present to you with a lot of new challenges especially if you are dealing with people even if your software doesn't deal with people directly, at some point it's going to have to. Because if it doesn't, then it doesn't really have a, a purpose to exist then. Software, in the end, uh, at the end of the day, it ceases to serve to the people in the end. And this is why we must focus our efforts on making the product the best it can be, no matter if my personal belief uh, are pushing me to take decisions that go against that, the second you notice that your product is suffering for those beliefs, the right thing to do will be to just, you know what? I hate to, uh, who knows, to allow this, this guy to uh, speak on my website, uh, but if I begin... Um, creating mechanisms for censoring people that I don't like, I don't personally like. I am wasting my time uh, that I could be using to create a, an actual really good feature for the website or something like that. So a lot of, um, a lot of effort is put into things just because you think, just because uh, the developer believes the world should be one way. And the truth is that every single person should decide that for themselves. I I guess everybody has an opinion. But the truth is that enforcing a line of thought on, on your product just because you are making them, uh, I, I don't think that's the way to go. I, I guess that you are assuming that you know what's best for your users. And sometimes that's just not true. Ideas must be put to test and the results should be speaking for themselves. And decisions should be taken based on those uh, experiences. So actually code is way different to learning to code. Why? Because learning to code can be done by yourself watching video courses and the only person that needs to be satisfied is yourself. While actually coding something requires the approval of more than one person and that's yourself. Because if the software only works for you and only you are happy with it, then it's not, is it really worth your time? Maybe for some people, uh, but at least not for me. If I'm building something, I want it to be as good as for me and for everybody else, or at least for the people that actually use it. And I don't mean in the great scheme of things to actually code something, for example, a website, and I'm not naive I know that if I wish to build something, uh, it, it can be used by a lot of people and 
everybody does have their own ideas and whatever they use my product is going to get results that for some people can be good and for some people can be perceived as, as evil even or bad. Uh, but the truth is that I don't see anybody uh, storming whoever is uh, producing weapons because people are getting killed by those weapons. I don't see, oh, okay, so uh, this cop just murdered someone. I don't see the people rioting on the manufacturers of weapons. So I see people going after the actual person that murdered somebody. So even a gun, which is a tool, by the way, and whoever made that gun, he's not responsible for the uses that people does with that gun. So we need to reclaim our agency and take responsibility seriously. It is it, not up to the software developers to enforce uh, even rules. I mean, you can build a tool, but it's going to be really hard to justify somebody who knows programming a, a self-driving car to automatically uh, stop whenever it, it suspects that the driver is actually trying to roll over somebody. Maybe uh, that's a complex issue that needs a, a really good debate with several people, <laughs> may I say. And for that reason, I will not actually engage into developing such a system because a lot of things are implied that whoever builds the software holds great power upon the life of others. And if I am removing that level of responsibility from the driver, uh, who knows? Uh, but I guess I am talking way too much about the implication of actually coding and not actually coding. So actually coding is going to come to you and slowly you are going to be creating this uh, this playing field for yourself. And I arrive to the conclusion that trying to fix the worst problems with software is pretty much useless. So I try to solve one problem and lead the philosophical things for the philosophical thinking for the actual humans and not assume that I am prepared or even capable of thinking for somebody else, let alone all the people that uses my product. And on the subject of code while learning to code, uh, um, let's just explore that a little bit. It turns out that inevitably, even if you decide to, you know what, I'm going to focus my efforts on finishing this video course, for example, or reading a book about, uh, you know, uh, who knows, programming with C, maybe, uh, or programming uh, with given, uh, insert your pro favorite programming language there, here. So you're learning to code and you're reading a book. And then uh, at some point, you get this itch about, you know what? Maybe I don't know everything about this programming language or platform, but maybe I know enough to begin building something and figure it out, whatever I'm missing, figure it out later. So this is a really great trap that many people fell into. Code while learning to code, it never gives the desired results. Uh, it's going to get you some results. Just not the ones you are expecting or that you actually want. Uh, the main issue with code while learning to code is that uh, you don't know what you don't know. And when the time comes that you need to make use or solve a problem, most of the time you are going to overthink it you are going to find yourself stuck for a very long time 
And when you actually manage to when you actually manage to solve your problem, it's going to be convoluted, it's going to be remaking something that somebody has already solved. And it's basically just not a good idea to do that. So uh a lot of humble opinion is going to be like um my humble opinion at least is going to be you know what just focus on develop a skill let's say you know what i want to become a full stack web developer translation i want to learn how to make a website which implies a lot of things by the way so uh learning html hypertext uh a markup language is going to be the first step for many people. And the results are going to be similar between them. But the truth is that HTML alone is really hard to work with. That's why CSS exists now. And that's why JavaScript exists. A lot of things that you see on, uh, on popular websites like YouTube came to be from a collection of other technologies and a lot of work. So when you are coding something, let's say, you know what? I want to create uh, this company's website. I already seen similar companies' websites and I already have an idea of what to do. And although the design could be pretty much the same, just with different company name, different uh, logos, uh, li different artwork, different content, may even. Uh, the truth is that as simple as a website can seem to be, most of the time, the features that are running on that website uh, are hidden. And those features seems to be very simple in on, on the front end. But most of the time, they they are really hard to do in the back end. One example of this is, for example, authenticate users into your website. Allow them to create accounts. Allow them to reset the password of such account. Allow your administrators to ban accounts, maybe. To, to reset passwords. Uh, just authentication in general. Um can become a really big issue really fast. So just imagine, I just learned some JavaScript, I just learned some CSS, and and, and I even created the entire uh, front end of the website, really beautiful. Uh, and now with just that, I want to create an authentication system. And allow users to log in into my website and uh, who knows, upload pictures maybe. And then you uh, hit really hard the wall of, you know what, I just want to upload a picture. What do I need to write in, e in HTML? What do I need to write in JavaScript? And then somebody, someone is going to come here and tell you, well, maybe what you are trying to do it's going to be really hard with just uh, the things that you had al that you have already learned. Maybe you really need to learn something else. For example, a, a backend system. Maybe Python. Maybe maybe Deno. Maybe Node.js. Some PHP backend system. Something. And you need to learn yet another programming language. That's why most people go with uh, Node.js, for example, because they already know JavaScript. So they just learn the new features of JavaScript running on a server. So they just skip the entire, I'm going to learn a new programming language entirely. But more and more people are switching to uh, Python and it's really powerful API. So who knows? Well, the thing is that while you are building your website, you are facing this wall. And this wall seems like a very simple thing. You know what? How do I load a picture 
on a website, on my website, on a website I coding with HTML, on a website from CSS, on a website using JavaScript. And you can Google along and you are going to find a lot of answers. But the truth is that uh, the question is really sophisticated. It's not a simple question. And that's the thing. It's not a simple question. And it does have a lot of right answers, not just one. And this wall is what a lot of people see and get discouraged because they see, okay, so I just want to upload a picture just like in Facebook. How do I do that in HTML? And when they don't get the answer they are looking for, or when they found the answer, but the answer is really complex and implies to actually learn something besides what they already learned, then they see the power of WordPress, then they see the power of uh, Squarespace, and they value now that a lot of these little easy things to do on the front end or easy things to do on social media do actually imply to uh, uh, to have people working really hard to just accomplish that. And especially today. So while you are building this project for your own and you face this wall, you are not jumping on uh, uh, upon it. You are not. You are not destroying the wall. What you need to do is to learn a new skill, and then you realize that learning these new skills implies even more time and effort than than you already put learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript combined. So, code while learning to code brings. Uh, brings me to the conclusion that I'm going to be speaking now. And that conclusion is that doing both code and learning to code at the same time do just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why? Because they are different things and they exclude themselves. And this is counterintuitive. Why do they exclude themselves? Well, because they are different activities and they are reaching themselves apart. So why does this, why is this? I, I mean, how can you say that if I am learning how to do something, doesn't it mean that if I do something, I will actually learn do that something uh, and the, the truth is that although the in, in appearance one may lead to the other or that both that can be do can be done at the same time uh, the, the risk the main reason why this doesn't happen that this doesn't work is because if you want to actually do something it's a requirement that you already know how to do something. So let's uh, let's uh, uh, use an example now. Let's see. Uh, let's imagine that you are creating a video game, and while a lot of people are going to tell you, you know what, you if you are making a video game, if you are learning how to make a video game, maybe you should start with something famous. Maybe uh, you should be doing the the next. Uh, Fortnite, the next uh, uh, insert famous video game here. Maybe the next Minecraft. Or maybe a better Minecraft. So that's the approach of the Chinese game developers, by the way. Mm -mm, they are not original, really. They just improve upon perceived formulas and call it a day. They are getting really good at that. Uh, but getting back to the point... Uh, it doesn't work learning to code and coding at the same time because they, as, as long as you want to learn, you are not doing. What I mean by this is that it's going to reach to the point of the wall. And if you want to know how to upload that picture, maybe somebody is going to tell you, you know what, you need to learn Python 
or you need to learn Node.js. And then let's pick up Node.js, for example. Okay, so Node.js, what, what that is? It's a, uh, you know what? It's an executable that runs on a server and executes JavaScript on the, on the server machine, not in the browser, not in the client browser, not in, uh, not anybody else, but on the, ma the actual machine. You get access to the file system. You get access to hardware. You get access to a lot of peripherals that you are not allowed to touch from a, a web browser. Printers, finger scanners, uh, whatever else, even webcams, cameras, uh, biometric sensors, whatever. So you have access to things that you don't really have access in a web browser. And that's pretty neat. But at the same time, you need to learn how to do those things. For example, if you want to upload a picture from your website into a, in, into your website, let's say. So I do have this picture. I open my website. I want to upload my picture on my website. Well, perhaps somebody is going to tell you in Node.js, whatever you need to do first is to, on the front end, you are going to create this, uh, this form. And with this button, you are going to ask for a file. And whatever file you are going to upload is going to be a picture. So maybe you, not, you need to uh, add this to your form. So after doing that, he's going to say, okay, that's the front end. And that was the easy thing to do. Now you need to move to the back end. And what is a back end? Well, it's whatever runs on the server. Okay. So when the user submits the picture pushing a button, that we are going to call submit, it's going to create a petition or a request. This request is going to be sent back to the server and the server is going to receive that such request and it's going to process whatever the request is actually asking for. In this case, the request contained, you know what, I want you to save this picture on the server and store it with this name and store it in this location on the file system. Then Node.js with your code is going to receive the picture. It's going to work its way around the file system and store the, the zeros and ones into a, a nice file and call it a day. And as simple as I just told you how that process really is, uh, it actually implies way lot more steps. It's not a thing that you can actually uh, do in five to two minutes, especially if you are just learning how to do it. And this is the moment that you realize, okay, so I am learning Node.js. I am learning requests. I am learning how to receive and process requests in Node.js. I'm not doing the feature of uploading pictures. And that's the thing that is going to kill you. It's going to say, okay, I'm learning this and it's really good and everything, but I'm not uploading my pictures on the website. When uh, am I going to learn that? And the truth is that you need the, the prerequisites of learning to, uh, how to work with Node, learning how to produce even your views on using the Node view engine, not just writing HTML directly. And you need to learn a lot of things and especially new things with JavaScript in order to achieve your simple task of allowing your website to upload pictures. Not even show them, just upload them. And this is the moment that most people fail to realize that if they want to do something, they first need to learn how to do such thing. So if learning to code is a requisite, is required to actually code, then why most people just want to code and learn to code while, while they are at it? Well, this is because people are used to immediate gratification and immediate gratification is a bitch. 
because immediate gratification feels really nice. You just want to love your pictures to your website and you just want a five minute, maybe two minute video on YouTube that explains to you how to do just that. And you are going to find it. And maybe you are going to copy paste a lot. Maybe you're going to follow some tutorials from, from the start to, to the end. But in the end, you are going to have these black holes on your knowledge base that need to be filled in order to actually implement the knowledge correctly. It is going to be really weird that you are able to upload pictures to your website, but suddenly whoever hires you is going to ask you, you know what? I want I want you to allow me to upload uh, these PDF files into the website and store them there as well. And you just don't know how to do that. It's going to be really weird. And it happens. Maybe not like that. Maybe, you know what? Uh, I'm not, not uploading PDF. You know what? If I already have the data on the database, maybe I just generate the document when requested. But such conclusions don't come as easily for people that are doing while learning. Because you are prioritizing the doing, most of the time you are going to build something that is not going to cooperate with the future yourself. And future yourself is going to know better in the future. So when future self reads the code and see how things work that your past self did, you are going to have one of two choices. You know what? I'm going to buy the bullet. I'm going to continue on no matter how awful my code is because I didn't know better back then. And I'm going to be paying for my sins now. Or take down everything that is badly done, rebuild it from the ground up with your new knowledge acquired and just do it right. Most people just keep legacy code going because it's the easiest thing to do. And this happens, a lot of systems are this way because the software developer was learning while coding and just doesn't work. Doing both at the same time doesn't work. So in the learn to code mantra, what's the right way to, to go? And um, for myself and in my humble opinion and experience, because uh, all that I just mentioned before, all those things, those horrible things that I just talked about, I myself just committed those sins and that's why I'm talking about them so well because I already lived them uh, and, and I pay a heavy price for them and I maybe I still paying for them. So my conclusion is keep learning to code and actually coding separate. So what do I mean by this? Um, what I want to say is, first, focus on actually learning to code. Get your books, get into your video courses, take your notes, and while you are learning, focus on learning the basics and understanding the, the basics properly. Don't do the job very well. Don't do the job good. Don't do the job good enough. Just do it correctly. Obviously, several levels of quality are going to be flying around. But the truth is that while you are learning, you are not learning how to design a better website for the end user. You are not learning how to uh, uh, revolutionize the, the social media space. No. You are learning how to create a variable and a store a number. You are learning how to create an HTML document that every, that any other web browser can actually understand. 
You are learning how to apply, uh, how to center something using CSS. And that's a big one for a lot of people. So centering stuff on a web page is not as easy as it sounds. So focus on that. Take your notes. Uh, keep improving on the basics. And when you get the hang of the basics and you actually understand them really for what they are, then you can get to doing. And you don't really need to wait that much time in order to do something. For example, uh, I am focusing on web development at the moment. And I came to identify uh, several roles on building a website. For example, uh, the first job that I will come into mind is design a website. The website designer, for example. This person is going to elaborate and create sketches for your website or websites. Elaborate how the website should be look in the end, how, how it should work for the end user and for the administrators. And this guy is basically just uh, throwing ideas in and choosing the best ones to achieve the, the desired result for the website. This guy is the designer. And this guy has to work a lot to have a lot of viable ideas to have to have I and such ideas are basically choices for the end user or choices for the, the one that is paying you to create the website. Another job after that will be uh, a marketeer, maybe. I don't know how to call this role in English, uh, but I will call it, you know what, now that I have the design in paper, maybe in a PDF file, maybe in Paint, whoever, maybe in PowerPoint, who cares? Uh, I just received this picture of a prototype website and I do know HTML, CSS, and even JavaScript. So I'm going to create this website on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and create a prototype of the website. Maybe I'm going to be showing a main menu and that main menu is going to move into another web page. Let's see, ah, oh, I click here and I can see an article, a blog post. Yet, even though I can show the blog post and it seems like, okay, so this website seems done. The truth is that the second I, ins I click on the login page, there is no backend engine doing anything there. It's just for show. And a lot of people are showing these demos and a lot of clients think that the website is easily done and very really quickly done. But the truth is that we are just showing uh, the the <laughs> uh, we're just peeling the website. It's just uh, it's just the cover. It's nothing else. It's a really good a really good a really nice boot cover. But the book hasn't been written yet. It does have pages. It seems to be had uh, like 400 pages maybe. You open the book, there is nothing there. It's just the cover. It's just uh, uh, it's just filled with blank pages just to make it some volume there. And that's the marketeer. So basically it's moving from, uh, 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 from a design into something that actually can be seen on an actual web browser. Hell, you can actually uh, implement, uh, if you are using Bootstrap framework, you can really easily do um, what, what they call in America uh, responsive web design, which is basically allow your website to adapt from mobile um, web explorers into desktop web explorers and laptop web explorers and tablet web explorers. Uh, so basically make your website responsive and be able to render correctly no matter the, the, the size of the, of the device that they are watching the website on. 
you can you can create really good prototypes that way. Another job that comes to mind on the front end department is the front end developer. And the front end developer is basically the guy that takes these uh, these prototypes and actually codes the real code that is going to generate from this prototype that only works once and doesn't change. So he creates the actual uh, code that is going to create this for real. However, uh, although things like the front page, maybe they don't move too much. The truth is that if you want to at least have a block on it, you need uh, a front-end developer that will allow you to, you know what, I'm going to render this blog post, which, by the way, required to be stored somewhere, most likely in a database, and that's for another job entirely. So this web, this front-end web developer really needs to gather a lot of knowledge and gather a lot of techniques and frameworks to make this happen. And this is considering that he already has the data to do so, that he doesn't have to uh, do something other than make a request to the, to the backend server. You know what? I want to make a request and that request should answer me with this data. The blog post title, the content of the, po of the blog post, and maybe a picture or two or whatever pictures I needed. So this kind of front-end developer tends to work with front-end frameworks like React.js, for example, which is a very popular framework which is being created by Facebook team. Thank you. Thank thanks to the Facebook team uh, from my part and from a lot of people, I guess. And uh, another job, for example, after crossing that line in complexity, um, we are going to be finding, well, if you are writing blog posts for your website, maybe you need to store that information somewhere. And more likely than not, you are going to be using a database. So here comes the uh, database monkey or the database administrator, which sole purpose it is, I guess, is to model uh, a databases that are going to be serving this data to whoever or whatever system requires it. This guy is going to design the database, its relationships, if they are working with SQL databases. Uh, and that, those databases need to be stored in, in a database engine. So he needs to know the database engine used he needs to create, who knows, uh, queries, views, stored procedures to make complex things with the data and keep that complex things with the data uh, hidden away from the backend developer. So basically, the database monkey is the one that ensures that the data is safe, that the data is true, and that there are no more than one copy of the truth anywhere. So there is only one truth. So it's not your truth or, or somebody else's truth. No, there is just the truth, uh, at least regarding data. So it's going to be really difficult to face uh, <laughs> the, whoever is hiring you and tell him, you know what? On this table, the price of the car, for example, is one thing. And on, on, on the table for the lawyer is another price. Uh, it's the same car. Why are they priced differently? Well, maybe this person negotiated one price, but later that day, this person negotiated a better price. So, okay, so why doesn't the price of the car for this deal remain one single price for everybody else? So, uh, those maybe common sense doesn't come to us in, in, in the same shape or form. Uh, but it does exist and you need to get some of it. But the thing is, database uh, guy uh, is are really needed. They really need to do their job right. 
Uh, although a lot of people just discard them because, oh, you know what? I just want a table and save my data there and retrieve it and that's it. And they grossly underestimate the amount of, of work that is actually required to do the job right. Not amazingly right, not, am not, not impressively well, just right. Another job is obviously the backend developer. So while the database guy is going to store data and create the model of the database on how to save the data, the truth of the matter is that is the backend guy, uh, the main programmer of the website for the sole reason that he is the one that is going to receive such requests from the front end guy and is going to gather the data from the database guy and he's going to collect everything and and basically apply control over the data in the sense of, you know what, uh, I'm going to retreat only the data that I'm required to, that I've been required of and just send that data back. Or maybe uh, the control of the, the business logic is inside the, the backend server. So I need to create all the logic, for example, authentication of users. Maybe uh, business logic like uh, inserting or deleting items from an inventory system. Uh, that sort of thing. And a lot of things are being developed by the, by the backend developer, not just uh, the obvious ones. For example, how to upload a picture that has been, uh, that this is the moment where the backend developer needs to work on that. Uploading pictures, creating PDF files from the database data and serve it forward for a request. And basically, uh, receiving requests from the front end guy and getting data from the database guy and from the file system also. Because, uh, it's not 2000, so we are not saving files inside blood files on databases anymore. So we are using the file system to actually store files, not databases uh, to store files that just don't, please. So we are getting these uh, files into the file system on the server. We are recovering these files from the, from the file system on the server and getting them back to the front end guy. And the front end guy is able again to, you know what? I sent this request for the blog post and I got that magically, automatically from the back end guy. The back end guy sent me this, um, this object which contains uh, a blog post title, a blog post content and the blog post main image, maybe, or maybe more pictures. Who knows? Uh, the truth of the matter is that the back end guy is the backbone of every single website. Uh, perhaps in the future, they are going to be specializing even more. Uh, yet the backend guy does, uh, does hell accountable for most of the work. However, once this work is done, most of the time, he doesn't need to add new features that often. Why? Because most of the features uh, keep coming for the front end guy. The front end guy is basically the one that is going to keep working and working and working and working because most of the features tend to uh, be seen by the end user anyway. And the back end guy can reuse lots of his own code in order to fulfill uh, the request because basically, you know what? Uh, Somebody wants to have, uh, who knows, maybe a, a, a pay interest kind of thing, uh, as, uh, before, before opening the blog post. Maybe I want pictures, uh, on this size for my blog post and maybe the user is going to click one and then it's going to render the blog post entirely. That seems like a lot of work for the front end side of things rather than for the back-end side. Uh, but never mind that. Uh, there is also work for everyone. But the truth is, of the matter is that not all the work is on the same proportion for everybody. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> I, I've been talking for an hour now. <laughs> okay. So 
what I'm trying to say is that the uh, in the end, the the back end guy is going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting at the beginning, and maybe not so much afterwards. Um, finally, and not less importantly, the DevOps guy. So who is this guy? DevOps guy or girl or whatever. Uh, he's going to be the person that is going to take all this source code from all the other guys and make them a real thing running on the web. Or maybe he's going to implement it on a private network on a company. Uh, this is the guy that gathers the source code and needs to uh, research and look how to actually host these services online, how to implement this software on a company, how to actually install the thing, not just build it. So while every uh, everybody else is just building the product, this is the guy that dedicates his time to actually uh, install the product and, and make sure that it's running properly. So DevOps guy... Uh, learns a lot of things that software developer doesn't necessarily have to learn because it's not really directly related to programming as much. Uh, for example, containers, uh, like um, o sea, containers, virtual machines, maybe cow compute, computing uh, ser uh, web services, and how to how to regulate how much money do do you spend while running your website, maybe how much computer power you are willing to use monthly. And maybe, you know what? Maybe this process that you're running every single day can be run once every week, maybe even less. And, and so, uh, and, and a lot of work has to come here. Uh, but, uh, one of the main issues that I see the boss guy dealing with is, uh, the issue of requirements. For example, if you are trying to deploy a website uh, that a lot of people are working on, most of the time, uh, and this is a mean quote, uh, you are going to hear, uh, well, the programmer says, it worked on my machine. I do not know why it doesn't work for you. Uh, and that happens a lot because the programmer is only worried about installing software one time on his computer and the DevOps guy needs to make that work for everybody else, no matter what platform does he chooses. So DevOps guy needs to deal with developers a lot. Developers doesn't have an, an, an incentive to really make this. Uh, we, we hardly do documentation of our own code, much less in documentation about how to actually install it because we assume that the installation of software should be something that whatever, whoever is implementing it should already know. So this responsibility is falling back into the DevOps guy anyway. However, if we are uh, working on software development, we are more um, attuned with the requirements of installation of such software and we should be able to help a lot DevOps guy. But never mind, that's just my opinion. So DevOps guy is the, the last point of this. And maybe you can insert unit testing guy there. You, you can insert uh, a pipeline guy there if you want. Uh, but in my personal experiences, when the team grows into that level, uh, I don't know, man, uh, who... who who is in charge of automa uh, of making automated tests uh, is a good concept, but I had failed to see a, a proper implementation of that. So maybe in the future, or maybe I do everything myself, who knows. Uh, and well, I've been talking for around one hour and nine minutes. Uh, thank you for listening to my rambling here. And remember, keep learning to code and actually coding separate. Uh, there is a lot of things to learn and there is a lot of things to do. But keep in mind that getting the hand of the basics is the most important. And whatever project you want to build, then take into consideration that it's not going to be 
simple to use or simple to learn and much less simple or easy to actually build. So keep learning to code, um, keep yourself safe, keep yourself separate from everybody because we are still in quarantine and, I, and be safe, I guess. Goodbye.